Jesus Image Church. Good morning, online viewers. So I woke up this morning and just two things have just been on my heart. One, we have a faithful high priest that is forever seated at the right hand of the Father. That's amazing. And just the other thing was the power of God. And uh, he just brought me to this scripture in Luke twenty two sixty nine, 69. When Jesus was uh, being questioned by the religious leaders, he says, Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. And I just feel like today and tonight, he just wants to break something open within us with his power. Amen. And so, Father, we come to you as your body. And I just pray, Father, that you would reveal to us your power this morning, that you would reveal to us just how good you really are and how for us you really are. And I pray, Father, that, that your agenda would be had today. We release our agendas, Lord. We release our expectations today. We come in just with a hope, a hope of your power. And Father, specifically, I pray over the kids' ministry today, that your power would be revealed in the kids' ministry that you would start there, Lord, and that today would be a seed for the upcoming week, Lord, as we travel, that you would release your power over them traveling today and fill them afresh, Lord. Fill us afresh in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
the glory, it's yours, it's yours, it's yours. All of the glory, all of the glory, it's yours, it's yours, it's yours. And all of the glory, all of the glory, it's yours, it's yours. He shall reign. All of the glory, all of the glory, it's yours. Forever and ever, all of the glory, all of the glory, it's yours, it's yours, it's yours. And all of the glory, all of the glory, it's yours, it's yours, it's yours, it's yours. All of the glory, all of the glory, it's yours.
no one like you, there's none beside you, the exalted King of Kings. The exalted Lord of Lords, there's no one like you, there's none beside you, the exalted
worship you
Jesus, that's the cry of our heart. We want you to be loved by us, Jesus. We want to minister to your heart, Jesus. That's why we're alive. 
Lord, if there's anything we want in this world is to love you, Jesus, and to love you with all of our hearts. We don't want to hold a piece of our heart away from you, Jesus. You gave us everything, Lord, when you died on the cross for us, Lord. And we want to give you everything, Jesus. So Holy Spirit, teach us to love Jesus. Show us his heart so that we, me, we can understand the way he wants to be loved. Oh, we worship you, precious Jesus. Just tell him you love him for a moment, church. We love you, Jesus. You're beautiful, Jesus. You're beautiful beyond anything we could ever imagine, Lord. You're so worthy. You're so holy. Beautiful lamb that was slain. Beautiful lamb that was slain. Oh, Jesus. Holy, holy, holy. You are so holy. May we never forget your holiness, Lord. May we never treat you as common here at this church, Lord. You're our friend, but you're also our Lord. Let us remember this, that you're also our Lord, even though you call us friend, you're Lord of our life, which means we give you full permission, full permission to rule and reign, Lord, in every part, in Jesus' name, amen. That is my favorite song that we have written because that's the cry of our heart, amen. Um, I just wanna share real quick, um, when we were worshiping, I saw this vision of fans circulating and I thought, why am I seeing fans? I saw so many fans. And then I heard the Holy Spirit say, when, you, when fans circulate, it does a current. And I really feel like there's gonna be a current of the Spirit that's gonna hit today. And I believe that it's gonna circulate in here and it's gonna go out. So we say yes and amen, Lord. Oh, Holy Spirit, stir up those waters, stir up those wells, stir them up in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you, God, that it will not just be in this church, Lord, that it will go out, Lord, to the world. In Jesus' name, even when we're about to go on tour this week in California, Lord, I think that's why I might have seen that, Lord. Stir it up, God, stir it up, stir it up in Jesus' name. Start your electrifier insides, God. Don't give us rest, Lord. We want you. We want you in Jesus' name. Do it, Lord. We allow you. We give you full permission to do whatever it is you want to do. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, I love you guys. Can we let your, the worship team and the choir know how much that we love them? They're the best. Love you. We're going to welcome David up. You guys can go to your seats. Let David know you love him. Thank you, Emily, for that clap for David. As you make your way to your seats, can we just thank the Lord one more time? Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful that your presence is here today. We glorify your name. We love you, Lord. Just like Jess was saying, Lord, you are the Lord of all. We're not here just singing songs. We're even in this idea of giving in our tithes and our offerings. We're not just giving to, to Jesus' image, Lord. We are giving to you. Let us remember that, Lord. We bless you today. In Jesus' name. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Malachi chapter 3. If it's okay, we're going to deep dive a little bit into the Bible here. This is Sunday morning, so it's all church family, so uh, it's going to be good. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, it says, I am the Lord, and I do not change. Let's pause there for a second. That's a powerful statement. Aren't you thankful that we serve a God that doesn't change? We serve a God that's faithful. His character is consistent. Who he is is consistent. That is why you descendants of Jacob are, all, are, are not already destroyed. That's also a pretty good thing, too. We serve a God who doesn't change and who doesn't destroy us after our mistakes. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me and listen to the faithfulness of our God, and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? Verse 8, should people cheat God 
yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? And listen to this powerful statement. You have cheated me of the tithes and the offerings due to me. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it and put me to the test. I think what's, uh, what's great about this verse and also what's challenging about this verse is we serve a God who's consistent. We serve a God who doesn't change, who is faithful to return to us when we return to him, but who has a powerful command, which is don't cheat me, don't rob me of what is holy. Leviticus talks about how the tithes and the offerings are actually holy unto the Lord. And oftentimes in the church, we can kind of skip down uh, to this last part where I will open the windows of heavens for you. I will pour out a blessing for you. And we hold on to that scripture so, so tightly, but we forget the promise and the command that is first established, which is don't cheat me, don't rob me in your tithes and offerings. Then I will open the windows of heavens. Test me in this. And I think there's something really, really important when it comes to our tithes and our offerings is that we remember who we are giving to. The Lord establishes this, but he says, I am the Lord of heaven's armies. We're not just giving to a a random charity organization. We're not just giving to another nonprofit. We are giving to the Lord of lords, the king of kings, the ruler of heaven and of earth. And there's something very specific that he asks for, and that is our tithes and our offerings. That is something that is not just the leftovers. The Lord is specifically asking for our best, our first. And then he is faithful and he doesn't change and he will bless us and pour open the windows of heaven for us. But we have to do something first. And so when it comes to this idea of tithes and offerings, I'd love to just challenge you today. I've got a smile on my face while I'm doing this. I'd love to just challenge you to honor the Lord And what he asks. To remember that who we're giving to is worthy of everything. And so as we give to him today, I would simply just challenge you. Is what, with this question, is what you're giving worthy of the one you're giving to? Is what we're giving worthy of the one that we're giving to? I, I promise you if, you, if you're new to church or maybe you're new to Jesus' image and you're still kind of unsure about this idea of tithes and offerings, be faithful to God's word. Trust in him. Obey him. And he is faithful and good. He doesn't change. When we return to him, he returns to us. That's how good and faithful are of our God he is. And he will bless us. He will be gracious to us. But there's a command first that we have to obey. And that's to honor and be faithful to him, not cheat him in our tithes and our offerings. For for my wife and I, that looks like every paycheck, we just simply give him the first before any other expense, before any other coffee or anything else comes out of our account. The very first thing that we do, and we we like to do it in 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 our quiet times with the Lord, is to just give him the very first thing that hits our account after that paycheck. Lord, here's our first 10%. Lord, we just give it to you. We trust you. Lord, we give you the very first, the very best, because we know that you are faithful to bless us with the rest. And this isn't like a a generosity thing. No, we we just want to honor the Lord with what he says and with what he's asked. And then we know he is also faithful to do exceedingly and abundantly. Amen? So as you give today, I would challenge you. Is what you're giving worthy of the one you're giving to? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for your church. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are faithful and that you are good. Lord, I pray, Lord, that as we honor your word, as we honor what you say and what you command, Lord, you are faithful. You are good. You will bless us. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. Lord, I pray a blessing over your church. Lord, let this be a joy. Let this be such a pleasure and an honor to be able to give to you in our tithes and in our offerings. We love you. We praise you. We give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, amen.
Amen. If you're here in person and you'd like to give uh, in person, you can simply just slip up your hand and us will come by with an envelope uh, to be able to have you fill that out and you can rush the bu buckets. There's also text to give options there on the screen. If you're watching online, you can follow the promptings there to give on the screen as well. And we'll be right back with you in just a moment. We give the Lord praise. Are you happy to be here? Well, we, uh, we're in for a, a huge blessing this morning. Pastor Ben Fitzgerald is with us. And uh, they missed you. <laughs> I, say, uh, I say Pastor Ben because he's pastoring a church now in Germany. If the Lord could make pastors out of Ben and I, he can do just about anything. <laughs> but uh, I'm excited. I know the Lord's going to touch us, Ben. It's going to be awesome. May I have the team who is leaving for the Jesus Tour tomorrow to California? Are you here? Musicians, anybody who's traveling, would you raise your hands? Or just come up. Why don't you come up, please? Can we give them a, a hand, let them know we love them? 
like you all to just come stand up here. Um, we have uh, had to close down all registration. Look at this tribe that's going. This is awesome. Y'all come close, come close. Come closer. Uh, Costa Mesa is completely full and so is San Diego. Um, we've had to put overflows in. Uh, America is trembling and uh, hearts are aching for the Lord himself. Amen. So I just want to take a moment and I would like, uh, I'd like our local church, our church family. And by the way, this is an extension of, of your life. I mean, this is what the church is meant to do, to worship Jesus. We're to, bless, we're to be blessed coming in and blessed going out. And uh, this is a church uh, missions outreach. That's what this is. And so I want us to all be part of it. I want your hearts deeply connected to it. So could we all stand up, please? Would you do that? And uh, I'm going to ask Amy and Ryan to come. Would you guys come up? And I'm going to ask them to pray. I'd like you, Ben, would you just come up just to stand with us? And um, I'm going to ask these two, yeah, you guys come close. And then I'd like you just to stretch your hands while Amy and Ryan each pray. And let's, let's just declare uh, a blessing over, over this whole group. I want them to go forth with the momentum of the local house. Jesus, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you as a church for this team, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for the gospel that will be preached in California, Lord. We thank you that from the moment the team lands on the ground, Lord, that your presence goes with them, Jesus, that there is no striving, Lord, that they come as yielded, humble vessels, Lord, to declare your gospel, Lord. It's your gospel, Jesus. So we thank you for your fire and your power to go with with them, Jesus. I thank you for boldness like never before, Jesus. Boldness like never before, Lord. I thank you for the worship team, Jesus, that they will be led by your Holy Spirit, Lord. That from the moment that they sing the first note, that they that they strum the instrument, Lord, that the glory and the tangible presence of Jesus would fill those churches, Lord, would fill those churches, Jesus. We thank you for the media team, Lord. We thank you for the ones that will be at the booth, Jesus. We thank Thank you for the ones that are behind the scenes, Lord. Would you encounter them as well, Lord? Would you encounter them, Lord? We thank you for the gospel to be preached in clarity. We declare thousands will come to know you this week, Lord. Thousands will come to know you, Lord. Thousands will be healed this week, Jesus. Thousands will be delivered in Jesus' name. Broken hearts will be mended, Lord. Families will be restored in Jesus' name. Children will be saved in Jesus' name name. So we declare and we plead the blood of Jesus over them, Lord. Your gospel will go forth in power in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, let's continue to stretch our hands. Father, we thank you for unity on this team as they go to California. God, I pray that they are in one mind and in one accord, Father. I thank you that they are held together by strong ties of love. God, I thank you that they prefer one another as they go forth, God, into this nation, Jesus. God, and we declare California will see revival in Jesus' name. California, the name of Jesus will be lifted up in California, God. We thank you that the soil is ripe in California, Jesus. And we thank you for these vessels going forth, that the gospel will be preached in clarity, authority. God, we thank you for every musician, God, for every tech team person, God. We thank you fluidity within the team, Lord. God, and we just thank you, Father, just like Amy said, for salvations, true salvations, true conversions, true healing, God, to take place in California. God, we thank you up and down that coast. They will see the name of Jesus glorified, lifted up. God, we thank you for gang members, for drug addicts, for the lost. Father, in California, to be saved in Jesus' name. We thank you religion is broken off of people in Jesus' name. God, we declare, Father, that California shall be saved. God, and we thank you for this team. God, we thank you for a wave of revival to go from Orange County to Orange County. We thank you for everything you're going to do this week. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's seal that with praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You can be seated. I'd like the team to stay up here just for a moment, just for the sake of 
just flowing with the Lord here. Um, as you know, by the way, for those of you who attend, uh, you know I rarely do this. For those of you who are new here, I just want to say that. Uh, rarely would I ever receive a second offering, but we've had to pay an additional, Carla, where are you? 400,000, is that the number? Four, we have had to purchase a secondary, a secondary media uh, system. Uh, that includes, you know, basically everything we do here that we broadcast to the nations. We just got back from being with Ben, and Ben was telling us how many people in Germany uh, and in Europe have been blessed by what the Lord's doing here in the room. So it's much bigger than just putting up some live stream for, for views. People are being touched and impacted. Additionally, my father-in-law called me last night. He's in Toronto and just did an event with uh, leaders from the Arab world. I think there were about a thousand of them in the room last night, all Arab ministers. And when he mentioned Jesus' image and what the Lord is doing, they all started screaming. Egyptians started going nuts because they're tuning in, many on a daily basis, to be part of what the Lord is doing. So that being said, this is not just our desire to, to film something. We want to share with the nations what the Lord is about to do on the West Coast. And we feel like Revival Fire is going to burn from San Diego all the way up to Reading by the time we're done in October. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to come to our church family right now and lovingly but boldly encourage you to get in on the harvest and put your heart, listen very carefully, in line with what is on God's heart. When you prove that in heaven, that your priorities are God's priorities, God then makes your priorities his priorities. And this is a wonderful way to live. So you can scan that QR code. Um, uh, if you're giving here in the room, you can scan that QR code. If you're giving online, we would like to invite you to do the same. If you've been blessed by the live stream and you want to tune in to what the Lord is about to do next week in California... This is a wonderful way to be involved in that. Let me pray. Father, quicken our hearts. I thank you that this entire need will be met, that it will not be a burden on us. It will not, you, will, you will meet the need. We trust you. And I thank you now for speaking to people in this room and around the world to sow into what is so dear to you, your presence and the preaching of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise? I want to give you a few moments to give. Team, you're dismissed. Judy, would you stay up here? I just want to worship for a moment. Let's, uh, let's sing I Stand in All, all Glory. We'll start there. And, when, and um, uh, Carla, are we going to do buckets as well? Okay. So you can bring the buckets up. And uh, in just a moment, Ben will be up to minister. All glory and all honor, all worship and all praise, all blessing, all power.
We all stand, please, if you're still giving. You can continue to do so. Thank you, Lord. Come here, Judy. Thank you, Lord, for Judy, this precious gift. Thank you for her heart, her humility, the oil of the Spirit on her. Thank you for sending her to us and trusting us. What a gift she is. Bless her today. Fill her with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Love you. Love you. Um, ben has been such a blessing to this house, really from its earliest days, before we even knew it was a church. Uh, I think when we were, yeah, Ben and I held a baptismal service at St. Andrews, the little Presbyterian church, in the freezing cold winter. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it there. It was quite the interesting baptismal. <laughs> but Ben has been a dear friend to Jess and I. He's a loyal man. He is a man who loves the Lord and loves his people. He loves the word of God. And uh, God has placed a zeal on him that we need. And uh, as we were worshiping, the Lord began speaking to me. I feel like God is going to very specifically minister to some of you between this morning and tonight. I want to encourage you to get here early tonight. It will be pandemonium in the best, most glorious way. But Ben is a real treasure. He's a gift to the nations. He's a gift to this house. He's a gift to people who know and love him. Uh, we go way back to Reading. That's where we really first met. And so it's an honor to have you here. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving this house and, and these people. I know we missed him, didn't we? It's been, it's been about a year. So can we just give Ben the most honoring welcome we know to give and open our hearts to the power of the Holy Spirit that is about to flow. Hallelujah. You want to give a mighty praise and shout to Jesus? Come on. <laughs> praise. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> oh, I love Pastor Michael and Pastor Jess so much. And um, I'm very thankful to be here. It's a real honor to be with you. My foot's hurting a little bit, so I'm just going to sit today. Um, I had something happen, but... It's getting better. What's that? Benny will rub it for me? Okay, praise the Lord. Benny, today, that's, you have a, one assignment. <laughs> After church, I'll be, make sure this happens. Um, I get the honor. I don't know how many people get to stay with uh, Pastor Michael and Pastor Jess, but I get the honor of doing so. And uh, Jess always calls me. She's like, my fourth child has arrived. And uh, we have a lot of fun. Guys, I, I had this word burning in my heart um, for a few months now. and You know, when you catch a word from God and it gets refined over time and it gets deeper and you start to see different sides to what God is speaking. And so I'm going to speak to you very vulnerably, straight from my heart this morning, from the Lord. And um, I, I just want you to hear some things that I think will really speak profoundly to some of you. Some of you might be like, wow, that's so strong. But it's not a rebuke, it's, it's God's kindness. And, and I want to show you through how he's done this with me. This isn't just about you, this is about me. And uh, I want you to open the Bible to the book of Hebrews 12. And I want to talk today, if I could name this message something, it would be something like this. Can you be fathered? And we're going to look at what that really looks like. <clears throat> we're going to go through a lot of Bible this morning because the Word of God preaches much better than I do. But I really have deep expectation that this will speak to you, okay? So Holy Spirit, I thank you. I have prayed this morning. I prayed last night. I pray again. I ask you, Lord, that you would illuminate your Word in the hearts of these precious people. It's a great honor for me to be here, Lord, and to speak to this family. And I pray, Father, that you would do your work mightily. In Jesus' name. How many of you, put your hand up if you love being corrected. 
<laughs> Some of you are like, uh, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not so sure. <laughs> I see a fun argument happening here on the front row already. Um, <laughs> so let, let me ask again. Put your hand up if you love to grow. Yeah, that's better, right? The word growth is, um, is far better and, and much more exciting. But that's not really the way God sees things. He doesn't see things as just growth. He sees things as in, a moment of intimacy to relate to us. And, uh, and God has been taking me on this personal journey of fathering me in a way in the last few years like I've never been fathered by God before. And so you'll hear a lot of, again, very vulnerable things come out of me today. I prayed last night. I said, God, in my weakness, show yourself strong today. And, and I want to share that with you because sometimes people have this illusion that a minister will never have a struggle, that a minister never wrestles even with God. I'm not saying that we wrestle with the Lord himself, but we have a human will. We, we didn't get left as robots. We were born again, but we have a human will. And sometimes my will has gotten in God's way. And what could have taken five years or, or sorry, five days took five years for me to be transformed. And the Lord's been shepherding me in kind of a deeper way. And I've been in this season for the last few years where he's been pruning me and exposing things like pride in my life and, and other little areas. And sometimes it's not big. It's just the one percenters, the two percenters. It's not like God is doing this to point out, oh, you're so bad. No, we are completely dependent on his righteousness. We are nothing without the cross. And, and I know that. But once we get grafted in, once we become his precious children, he does his work of fathering us in a way of, of real intimacy and also in a way of correction. And he uses his word and he uses friends. He uses many things. But one thing the Lord's been showing me is that there is a difference between a child of God that is fathered and one who is not. We're going to discover that just right here in Hebrews 12. Are you there? Let's just read here from, from verse 2. <clears throat> Looking unto Jesus. Oh, <laughs> three, three words that will encapsulate your life. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, say joy, that was set before him endured the cross. Despising the shame, he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. In other words, consider how much people attack Jesus before you jump up to some high place where you think you're too good to be attacked. I've had the great honor in the last six months of being persecuted publicly in the German media. What an honor it has been. It immediately stirred up feelings of self-defense and, and pride and my own reputation. I remember there was a book many years ago written by Rick Joyner. And the book was written um, about his encounter he had with the throne of God. And, and he saw these people wearing these beautiful cloaks of humility. And there was, a, I think it was an angel or something spoke to him and said, you know, the sins of the church in this modern day are not the sins you think of, Rick. And, and he said to him that the sins of the church are not sexual immorality or anger or misuse of money. Of course, they're still sins. But he said the sins of the modern church are self-righteousness, respectability, unrighteous judgment, looking at somebody with an evil eye, and, and trying to get revenge and, and letting things be in our hands and our control instead of the hands of the Lord. And I tried to do that, honestly, the last few months. I, I, I felt immediately this longing inside me to, to defend myself and to fight. And, and I'm like, that's not fair. Right. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you, Ben, become weary and discouraged in your soul. What happens when I'm weary and discouraged? When I'm weary and discouraged, I don't relate to God the same way. I might come to God and I might come with, with desperation, but I don't come in the same affection toward God. It, it ruins me. It doesn't ruin them. The people who wrote the article against me are still having a great life. But all of a sudden I'm destroyed because something inside me has the need to justify myself. Can I tell you something, friends? No one will ever be justified on this earth. 
Even the Son of God was not. He was only justified by the work that the Father did in him. He was justified by resurrection. He was justified by his purity. But even he was attacked. You're in great company when somebody doesn't love you. And you need to look at him and go, God, you were ashamed. You were oppressed. You were persecuted. You were hated. And yet you still continue to walk in this extreme love with the Father. It doesn't mean he had no boundaries. Paul kicked people out of the church. Paul said, that's the boundary. You crossed it. But they didn't change their heart posture in life. They didn't become weary and discouraged in their souls. They, they continued with God. And there's a reason why, because our example is the Lord. But our example here is an interesting one with Jesus. Because God the Father is saying, he's like, look at Jesus who looked at me, who endured a cross, who was hated by people, who didn't get discouraged or weary. Look at him. And then he says in verse five, he says, you have forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you as a son. My son, you ready for this? Do not despise. So now he flips the conversation from, don't look at what people have done to you. Now you need to focus on what I'm doing inside you what I'm going to do to you. <laughs> and this is the Father speaking to us now. And he says, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are what? Rebuked by him. I can tell you personally, the last few years, I've been praying constantly, Father, please discipline me. Bend me. Crush the areas of my life that are fruitless. Show me the mercy that Jesus, that he had to live with in order to endure persecution. Show me the love. Let my heart be dripping with love for people. Let me be bigger on the inside than the sin that's on the outside oppressing me. And God has really been taking me through this. That's why I said I have the honor of being persecuted right now a little bit in Germany by secular media. And they're saying that we have a sect and all this sort of stuff and a cult. And they're not used to people like you and I worshiping in this kind of freedom. And... At first, I was really upset, and, and the Lord was like, son, I'm using all these things to really kill and to do what you've been praying for years. You've prayed for years, Ben. I've prayed to God, Father, make me, Ben, make me like Jesus. I've prayed the mandate of this house, Romans 8, 29, conform me to his image. I prayed that for years. And sometimes it's the blessing of the Lord that conforms you to his image. But sometimes the hand of God, the pruning hand of God is inside your trials. And he's sitting there and the father's right there in the room while, while the relationship problem you're having isn't working, while the financial breakthrough that you need hasn't come yet. The father's sitting right there in his chair staring at you. And he's saying this to you. He's saying, have you forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you as a son? Don't forget this, my son. Now let's look at this, ready? Verse six says, for whom the Lord loves, say loves. Yes, Jesus loves me, right? You, we could put another part to that. Yes, the Father will prune me. <laughs> yes, Jesus loves me because the sharp sword is cutting me deep. <laughs> right? This is what it says. Whom the Lord loves. One more time. Love. Loves. And he scourges and chases and he scourges every son who he receives. He scourges. You know these words here? I tried to find the Greek. I, I tried to find a better version for you. The version in the Greek is worse. The, one of the versions of these words is, he punishes you. Oh, we're not under punishment. Well, yes, sometimes we are. But he doesn't punish us to destroy us. What does he say? I scourge you to receive you. I scourge you toward my bosom. I scourge you into my presence as my son was perfected through sufferings, so will you. But this is the part, verse seven, that I really wanted to deal with this morning. Ready? We only read this slowly. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. Did you catch that? If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. See, many people are Christians. Many people believe in the Father. 
I believe they're going to heaven, but God can't deal with them as a son. They're resistant. The father can't come close and say, this area of your life looks nothing like mine. He can't deal with them on a deep, intimate level. See, they can pray and they can worship, but it's not that. That, that doesn't make us a Christian. The, Jesus, you know, it wasn't just an anointed person who changed the world. It was a son who came. And he submitted himself to the Father. The whole process of us is, of being transformed into his glorious image is the ability for us to, to yield to our king, to yield to our dad and say, I trust you with my life more than I trust me. But to be honest, I didn't trust God with everything. There was many things even in my Christian walk that I had sort of put off. I, I'd even done kind of smart resistance to God. And what I mean by that is I would let people pray for me in a certain area. Yeah, you can pray for me because that felt like at least I got prayer. And I love prayer. And I love the immediate breakthrough, bam, it's done. I love that. But I remember very specifically one season where I was laying down on my floor. I was soaking a lot in this season. I, I really enjoyed, I was learning more about how to just submit to God in, in, and yield and be on the floor and, and just sort of let him love on me. I heard Bill Johnson preach about that, like let the Father love you. So I was like, okay, I'll let you love me, God. And as I was on the floor one day, at the end of my room where, where the door is, I felt the presence of Jesus. You know, you can sense Jesus. Sometimes he's very easy to miss. But sometimes he's very strong. You can feel him there. And you're like, the Lord is right here. He's, in, he's inhabiting my praise. While I was praising him, laying on my back, God, take my life. God, I love you. Fill me. You know, the, the, the hunger in me praying. And, and then I felt the presence of someone at the end of my feet. And that someone was Jesus. And I could tell. I was like, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Thank you for being in this room. I couldn't see him. It was just my, my spirit uh, sensing the Lord. But then I heard the Lord. I heard Jesus speak so clearly to me. This statement might shock you. It might even be outside of your theological box, but I know what God said to me, and I know why. He said, Ben, do you honor my father? Immediately, like that. I knew everything he wasn't saying. I knew exactly what he was talking about before he said anything else. He said, Ben, do you honor my father? And I was like, oh no. I remembered six months ago, God told me to deal with this certain area of my life. And then he told me again. And then eventually he sent a third person. And still in that area of my life, I was resisting. Yes, God, I'm praying into it. I'm on my journey with you, God. See, some of us, when we say like, you know, when we're going through a struggle and God is putting the sword to this struggle we're in and we come to people and they say, how are you? How's that thing you're trying to get breakthrough in? And we're like, well, you know, it's a journey. God's dealing with me. That is just openly speaking our own rebellion. We're telling God, I'm dealing with this on my terms. I'm speaking to you, God, about what I'm going through or about you uh, on my terms. This has nothing to do with any individual in this room. I'm just saying to you that that this is what I had done. And Jesus said, do you respect my father? Do you honor my father? You know why he said my father to, to me? He didn't say our father in that moment. Matthew 6 says ours, but he meant ours. But here's why he said my father. He said to me, son, I gave you my father. I wasn't born of God. The son came out of the bosom of the father. He came out of eternity. He gave me, he grafted me in. He said, let me introduce you to Yahweh, Ben. He died for my sin. He, he was the purchase price of my redemption. He was the one who took my place, but then he introduced me. I was created by God, but not every person who's created by God is fathered by him. Yeah. Satan was created by God. He's no longer God's son. He's no longer, he was never a son, but what I'm saying is no longer in God's family, God's kingdom. And I was given this father and, and given this relationship freely that I can approach Yahweh I can approach the throne with boldness and find mercy and help and intimacy and, and I can share my heart and bear my heart with God. I can cast my cares upon Him. I never had a friend like the Father. I've never been loved like this. And yet for six months, I was disrespecting His continual voice. And He said, do you honor? And I repented like that immediately. I was like, Jesus. I said, I'm so sorry. And I got it. I was like, you gave me this heavenly father. 
I'm born of your family now. I said, please forgive me. Yes, I will change this area of my life. I'll no longer pray about it. I'll surrender it. There's a big difference. See, some of you in this room or watching a live stream, you love God. You have a passion for Jesus, but you resist him in other areas of life. You're a saved person, but God can't deal with you as a son. Sons receive inheritance. Do you know why this is so important for you? Because something great is actually, come. we have something great already. We have the Holy Spirit on the earth, but there's a great move of God that is happening. And this church is at the forefront of it, this family. And you need to understand it. It's not just Pastor Michael and Pastor Jessica's job to seek the Lord. You can't come in on the coattails of other people's hunger. You have to have your own relationship with him. You have to have a walk that is so deep with him that he can prune you and you say, thank you, God. That you actually consider it a joy that's set before you to be pruned by the Father. You consider it a joy when somebody's angry at you and you haven't done anything wrong and you don't know why they hate you, that you learn to bless. I remember being at Bethel one time and when I first came on staff, there was this man who was um, very, uh, I'd say very structural, and he was very committed to, this is the process, this is how you do things. And, and I was a, a young staff member at Bethel, young pastor. And, and I was a wild evangelist. And, and so all I knew is you obey the Holy Spirit. And I didn't understand these protocols that we have in life. And this young man and I, he, he was working there several years before me. And we butted heads hard. Because I would start a home group in a drug neighborhood and just bring people and just, I just begin it. I was a, I was a pioneer. I was an activator. That's, that's what I was good at. And this guy was good at building systems. And I came in out of nowhere and just started all these things. And, and I remember sitting across a table with one of the, the eldest leaders, the older leaders of Bethel. And one of them was there. And um, he was sitting like where I am. And us two were like this. It was almost like one of those interviews before a boxing match, you know. And, um, and so... He said to me, you can't just do this, this, and this without checking with us. And I said, you can't try and control everything I do. You're just all about red tape. And I said, I want to start things. We have a gospel to preach. We have people to save. And he goes, yeah, but you need to check with us. You need to do this, this, this. And we were just going at it for like 10 minutes each. So the administrator and the evangelist, you know? And, and uh, eventually it got heated. It got heated where we were like red and, and looking at each other. There was no love of God. And, and, and this... this this person in the room, this older staff member is like, he, and, he, and he's a peacemaker, this staff member. So he, for first 10 minutes, he just said nothing because he was scared, I think. He was like, uh, he didn't know what to do. He's a peacemaker. And then after 10 minutes, he goes, guys, 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 you go home and pray and you go home and pray. And he goes, stop this right now. You pray and, and you pray. And I was like, you know, fine. So I did. I went back home and I was like, I can't wait to pray. So I got him. <laughs> and I know, I know, I love prayer. I love binding things. I love, like, I'm one of those guys, you know? I bind you, devil. Like, I was, I couldn't wait to get home to pray. So I get home and I get into my room. And literally, I got, I got right, and I get into my room. And I, before God, you know, I have this map where I used to pray over the nations and things. And it's my prayer room. It's my life. I had Billy Graham and, and or Billy Sunday, all these pictures of old Amy Semple McPherson, old black and white photos all over my room, pictures of stadiums. I, I had my vision set before me, so to speak. And so it was my time with Jesus. This room was like a room of faith for me, a room where I'd connect with God. And I said, Father, like very noble, Father, would you break the spirit of control? off this and in, in the middle of my prayer, in the middle, would you break the spirit? Ben. And it was like really right through me. And I'm like, oh, oh I knew it. I knew. I was like, he's not happy. I could feel it. <laughs> and, and, and that's the thing about our father, you know, like he has emotion. He, he has joy when he sees us do things for him that please him. He has joy when we laugh, he laughs. He, he's also though, we can frustrate the grace of God. And he interrupted me. He said, Ben, don't you dare pray another prayer like that, a witchcraft prayer in my name. He said, you pray right now for my best to come into his life, for my perfect will to come into his life. You pray that I would bless him. And I was like, ah, bless him? Bless him with what? More tape? You know, like, like bless him with more problems. I was like, oh, so Father, I thank you. 
I blessed him, you know, <laughs> you know, and the Lord knows you're trying, I feel like he knows you're trying. He's like looking at you, he's like, keep going, it'll get warmer. It'll get warmer. You're cold, you're angry and frustrated, right? Keep going, see how it comes out. You know, I was like, Father, I bless him. In the name of Jesus, I bless the guy, you know? <laughs> and then the Lord told me, later, a couple of days later, he said, you know what his favorite thing is? He loves to ride bikes, buy him a bike. I'm like, what are you trying to do? Make me like Jesus or something? <laughs> yes, that's the point. The trial you're in, the, the situation, the, the stamp of I need to be justified. It's not worth it. There's resurrection on the other side of you becoming like Him. There's life that comes out of you when you can give away the decay and the need to be right, the self-righteousness, the respectability. And you let God deal with you as a son, see? He can put you on His lap and go, no, we don't do things in our kingdom that way. What about gossip? When you can't stop running your mouth and, and the Father says to you, would you stop this now? You've prayed about it enough. You have to say something negative about others in order to make yourself feel better around others that you're higher and they are lower. You have to crush someone in order for your own soul to feel elevated. That is not how we do things, son. Let me deal with you. And it will hurt because it says it will right here. No chastening seems pleasant in the moment. It doesn't seem fun but it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. It actually causes you to come into his bosom. It causes you to feel such trust from the Father. It causes you to let go. Can God deal with you? Can you be fathered? Well, I can be fathered by God. Well, what if God sends a person? What if God sends somebody who says, the way you treat your wife in your marriage is terrible? You know, <laughs> I love miracles. When we preach your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we, we, we always think of miracles. I love that. But when the kingdom of God comes and the Father's good pleasure exists in a household and there's peace, there's the ability to be quick to forgive, there's the ability to turn the other cheek, there's the ability to go higher. This is the kingdom. Because the reason people say we're hypocrites is not because we do miracles. It's because they see something inside of us at times, not every one of us, that is vile and doesn't look like him. They see bitterness in there. And I've done a lot of that. I've had a lot of moments where I, I spilled out, even in front of non-believers, bitterness, things that aren't justifiable, things that ought to have died with my cross with him. Places where God wanted to deal with me. Turn your Bible over to John chapter 12. Is this speaking to any of you this morning? I want you to know very clearly that this message, I've been pondering this for months, literally months. I preached it in our school. It's getting deeper in me. John 12. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I want to read 24 again. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. See, some of you feel lonely, not because you're a more emotional person. You feel lonely because the grain of wheat is in your hands. It hasn't fallen into God's soil. It hasn't been fathered yet, it hasn't died. You still got reasons to hold on to control. And that's why you feel lonely. Some people lack the presence of God in their life, not because God doesn't want to come close. They lack it because the seed is in their hand. It's not in his kingdom. It's not buried close to his throne. It's just in their hand. And he says this, it, it remains alone. 
The life that continually justifies itself, the life that has to gossip, the life that has to be critical, the life that has to lie, the life that has to say, no, 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 God, no. God, I'm on a journey with my sexual immorality. The life that speaks this way, where the seed remains in your hand, ultimately will become lonely, very alone, still saved, still feeling like, yeah, I'm in God's kingdom, but how close am I to the Father? You see, we don't like that talk. We, we, we believe that everybody's just as close as everybody else to God. I don't agree with that at all. I don't believe that Judas was as close as John. I don't believe that people that resist the Father, that live in the kingdom of God and resist Him over and over and over again for 20 years, I don't believe that they're as close to His ear because the Bible says that the secret counsel of the Lord is with those who fear God. So there's a need for us to let go and to finally say, okay, God, these areas of my life, you can put your sword to them. You can father me and you can prune me, you can cut me. Further in Hebrews 12, it says, if you don't let God do it, you're illegitimate. You're not a child. You've left that. You're outside the window looking at the Father's house. I'm part of this, aren't I? Yeah, you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be at my banqueting table. But you keep making excuses running around the house here in, in the areas that I want to change you and prune you. God began to prune me so much in these last two years. And, and I want to just share before that, I want to share verse 26 because I want to show you how God did it. All right, verse 26, let's look at this slowly. If anyone serves me, this is Jesus, right? If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Put your hand up if you follow him. Okay, let's look even deeper into what he's saying. You ready? And where I am, there my servant will be also. Where I am, there my servant will be also. Okay, I'm going to make some radical statements. You can pray an hour a day and Jesus will say, thank you for being with me. Now come where I'm going and not go. You can follow the first part. I follow Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. But anyone who serves and follows, where he goes, you will. The seed is dead. It's not in your hands. The control has gone. You take me, God, where you want me. And let me tell you where God took me. For years of my life, even as a Christian, I struggled with the fear of marriage. I hurt people because of that. I wasn't sexually immoral. But what I do is inside my heart, I had this deep fear. So I'd go back and forward with people. And I would get prayer about this. And I would pray, God, please take this away. He didn't take it actually. I'd say, God, just, just remove these fears. Isn't it amazing how you can have an area in your life where you're so bold, like me, I would rent a stadium and believe for millions of euros, that didn't cost me a lot. It still cost me in faith and stepping out in risk, but that didn't, it wasn't the cost that I had to go through for this area in my life. I had to cry out to God, Lord, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm afraid. I don't know why I'm afraid. Maybe it's because I found my dad dead at 10 years old. I walked in on him after he suicided. Maybe that's where the fear came in. I don't know. But I said, God, I, I, I don't know why, but I'm afraid to go into a relationship. And then I pull away the second I do anyway. And I've done this over and over. I've repeated this pattern and I've hurt your people by doing this. Now, I wasn't immoral, but you don't have to be immoral to hurt someone. You don't have to be in sin to cause damage to someone's soul. It was my own backward forwardness and other people were like, I'm healed in this area. I'm free. I'm able to commit. I'm able to come close. And so I prayed into this for years, right? And I followed Jesus. But what did he say? If you follow me, where I go, there my servant will be also. Some people hide from the world. They hide from their calling. They pray. They want to be a Mary. I love Marys, but Mary also got up when Jesus left. I want to be a Mary, but I don't want to sit there and expect Jesus to keep coming back to me when he has something for me to follow him in. This is what he says here. If you truly follow me, where my servant is, well, sorry, where I am, there my servant will go to. So here's what Jesus said to me. I said, God, I'm clearly broken in this area. 
I've prayed into this. I've even confessed it. And he's like, I told you a long time ago. It's funny because God silently gives us these or softly gives us these instructions, do this. And people come to us, I did this and I got breakthrough. But I had great pride in my heart in this area. I did not want to go to a low place in this area. I wanted someone to pray and for it to just instantly disappear. But it was not going away and I was hurting people. So I said, okay, I give up now. I'm putting the seed in the ground. I'm not gonna hold this thing anymore. I'm going to die to this. You tell me what to do. And I heard it very clearly, go to counseling. Go to counseling. God, I'm a minister. Do counseling. No, I'm, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. <laughs> what does it say? If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. He said, Ben, I'm at the counseling session. I'm at you stopping hurting people and hurting yourself. I, I'm there for your future. Your father is sitting in the chair there, ready to prune you, ready to grow you, ready to set you free of years worth of this torment. All you need to do is submit to sitting in a chair and being humble and letting me prune you. I did counseling for 12 months. It was amazing. All this junk came out of me. This is in the last two years. All this garbage, that I, these perspectives, these mindsets of fear, this, if, the, if I choose the wrong person, is my life over? All this stuff that was there, it got pruned. I felt sometimes when I was on the counseling, I felt so raw. I was like, I'm leading a church. We lead state. I'm like, but I'm like, God, I'm, I'm such a baby in this area. I'm mature in this one. I'm mature in the scriptures. Uh, no, actually, that's a big statement. <laughs> I'm getting there. That's a big statement. But I'm mature in faith, I feel. I can have faith. I can, I'm bold. I, I have good, decent character, I think. But in this area, well, others should tell you that, the Bible says, let, let another man. But, but you know, what I'm saying is, I wasn't going out there stealing millions of euros. I wasn't fornicating. I wasn't living unrighteous, but I was living unfathered. You can live, right? You can be right with God, forgiven of sin, but not be intimately molded. And he molded me and he said, go to counseling. And I remember sitting there, these raw things would come up out of me. I'm like, I thought that was dealt with. I thought I had faith for that to be gone. And I had to humble myself under my father's pruning sword. And it really worked. It really blessed me. It was so funny because I used to be in BSSM in Bethlehem. I used to preach against counseling. <laughs> I used to sit there and say, you don't need that. You're a new creation. I used to say to people, you're far too attached to your feelings. You don't need to listen to them. Now I tell people, your feelings need to come under the dominion of Jesus. Yes. Your feelings aren't wrong, but if you're bleeding everywhere, you need to do something about it. Yes. So where my servant, where I am, there my servant will follow. And then he says this, if anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So what do we see here? We see a seed that if it doesn't go into the ground and die is lonely. It says it's left alone. Many Christians, lonely, what do I do with my life? Simply because of this, not because they have open hands, because they're controlling it. Their fears are controlling them. Their sins are controlling them. Their small secrets, their one percenters, their little things are still controlling their heart. And God doesn't want that to control you. He wants you to be totally purged. Unrighteous judgment. I remember reading this story of this married couple and they looked through a window every morning. They saw this, other, this, this girl, she was hanging out bed sheets. And they looked and they had their coffee table and they used to watch their neighbor. And every couple of days she'd hang out these sheets and, and stuff, clothing. And, and they would see and they'd look at her from their, their coffee table and go, what a stupid girl. She never washes her sheets properly. And they would attack her and, and you know, verbally and say, she's so dumb. They, they would they'd say, look at her again. She's five days later. She's done her washing again. She hangs up the sheets. They've got black spots all over them. There's stains all over them. And one day after coffee, the guy... He walked up close to the window and he sort of peered out to see where she was. And, and as soon as he got close to the window, he realized their window was what was covered in spots. <laughs> That's how we are with God sometimes. We're looking at everybody else's problems. And our own windows, our own lives are filled with planks and spots and things that we've resisted God in for years. See, I used to even justify it. That's how scary this can be. 
People would say, Ben, you have an issue. I'd go, yeah, but see, my father died. No, what I was doing there was I was making an excuse. I was using a past event to justify my present situation, to justify my present immaturity, to justify me escaping his sword. And his sword is how you know he loves you. That's what he said there. He goes, as many as I love, I chasten. So eventually God stopped speaking to me in these areas. And then I was like, okay, now I'm in, worse, I'm in a far worse situation because when God isn't pruning you, when someone doesn't occasionally come and correct you, you are probably going the wrong way. You probably have something in your life that, that is holding you in a stronghold and, and you don't see the truth about where you're at with God. And, and God will actually bring people over and over again until you get to the point where you're so broken that you have no other option but Him. And I got to that point and I'm still going through this. I'm not preaching at you. I'm, I'm in this with my father. He's pruning me all the time. He's like, Ben, sometimes you preach for pride. Sometimes you think too much through the sermon instead of praying through the sermon that it would touch my people. Sometimes you wanna sound great. I don't want you to sound great. I want you to preach the scriptures more. I want you to preach my words. They will do the work. We live in a, 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 a weird world where everything is about intellect and everything is about sounding a certain way. We can even fall into the trap in our charismatic circles of sounding intimate with God. But do you have a deep secret life with Him? Can your father meet you in secret and say, the way you treated your wife was wrong? Can he speak to you and say, your best friend has put up with you manipulating in conversation for five years and you've never listened to them when they've said, it hurts me when you say this. You've got no empathy, son, in your heart. Your heart is cold in empathy. You're weak in compassion, son. What a blessing it is when Jesus speaks that way. I want him to speak that way. I literally pray God constructs circumstances in my life that can prune me, that can get pride out of me. Let me tell you why. Recently, there's been many, many ministers who've been knocked off their perch. Do you know why they were knocked off? It wasn't because of their big sins. It was because for many, many years, the father was speaking to them, trying to prune them, trying to make them like who? The son. If he can be pruned with the father, if he can be taught obedience, I cannot be better than him. My path is the same path. It's a cross. But these ministers, these guys, they go around the world and they're on a stage and they're celebrated, celebrated, celebrated. Everything they do is about them. It's not, they're probably serving God innocently to begin with, but it's about them being celebrated. Bigger things, greater things. And God is sitting in the secret place daily, not with bigger things, with a small pruning fork, with a small sword saying, I wanna give you bigger. I want the nations to see me more, but this has to go. And years later, Years of resisting, years of not saying yes to being loved by your dad. See, I don't see it at all. Last night, I said to the father, I said, what do you want to do? He said, I want to pour my love on them this morning. I want to pull them out of these dark chains and these things. He wants to cut these things off. He doesn't want you to justify a five-year circle around another mountain. He doesn't want you to say, I'm trying to get free. You don't need to try. His sword will prune that, that, that grain of wheat. He'll slice it in half. And you'll all of a sudden not be lonely because you'll be like, oh, sucked up right next to his heart. And you'll be like, this feels raw. This feels painful. This feels like I've been, I, I can see it now. I can see it. I've been controlling my husband. I constantly cut him down. I've been rude to my boss. I never represent Jesus at work. I don't tithe because money is my little God. I don't give God, I'm not generous. And he'll show you and he's like, but I love you. I'm showing you because I love you. I'm showing you because now that will die in my presence. And now I can father you. And what happens when he can? He raises you up like he did with Jesus. He sets you on high in his secret place, in the place of his glory, in his holy presence. He raises you up and you stand there and you're not weak there. And you actually see God, the next move of God, the leaders are in this room, but God will not raise up orphans to fall. 
He'll only raise up sons and daughters who can be pruned, who are ready, who can stand and go, oh, I understand this temptation. I went through this 20 years ago with my father. And he pruned it out of my life. Let's read the last verse. I want to pray for you. Read Revelation chapter 3. Verse 18. Are you there yet? Revelation. It's right before the New Jerusalem. (laughs) Sometimes I say to people, like, Second Kings. It's right before Third Kings. Oh, Third Kings, yeah. (laughs) Am I speaking to any of you this morning? You're very quiet. Okay, okay. Verse 18. This is the Lord Jesus speaking to you. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Say, I love fire. (laughs) Say, God. (laughs) I dare you to say, God, put me in that refining fire. (laughs) No one said that. (laughs) Okay. Gold refined in the fire. That you may be what? Rich. Jesus rebuked people. They trust the money. He said, they're not rich toward God. There's no riches of the glory of God, that this intimacy daily with the Lord. There's no riches there. You can even be on the worship team here and you have no riches in the secret place. What's the point? <laughs> What's the point? You can get caught up in the swell of God moving through many of us and never have paid a price for it personally. And white garments that you may be clothed. Why do we need to be clothed, God? Because I'm tired of watching porn, Right? God delivered me completely of that. He put the sword to my pawn. I was a pawn addict as a Christian, and he delivered me. He put the sword so strong to it, it came at me from every angle. I was squeezed into the corner, and he said, you need to die to this? And actually, he rebuked me through Scripture. He said this, those who name the name of Christ must depart from inequity. And I felt so in the corner, like, are you telling me I have to choose? And he was saying this. He wasn't like, well, you could pray about it more. You could do some, you could really read a book about it. He was saying, yes, you need to choose. He did this in the Bible all the time. He said, you're not fit for the, see, these are scriptures that we have to understand in the tension and balance of being righteous and children of God. He's not threatening us. Jesus does not do that. The father says, I love you. That's why I'm pruning you. But here he says, be clothed with white so the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. I don't want it to be revealed. When I'm a 60-year-old minister with a mega church, I don't want the nakedness then. I want to be fully clothed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Jesus, let us see you. Some of you can't hear God, can't see God, don't feel like He's speaking to you because the seed hasn't fallen to the ground and died. You are lonely, you're still alone. And the Lord's been talking about so many areas, but you resisted it. And and now you don't see, like, what is your purpose for my life? See, if you assume that Jesus just lets you see the future without intimacy with Him, that's like a wife saying, "Let let me show you all the plans I have for us together. You can walk away from me, though, for 10 years and come back and see if you still want me. It doesn't work. Now, I'm not saying He's leaving you. I'm just saying to you, in general, this does not work. So he says, anoint your eyes that you can see Jesus again. This is the last verse I want to finish with, 19. You ready? I want you to read this out loud with me. Let's read it out loud. Ready? Is it on the screen? Yep. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Let's read that again. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. What's the key word there? What is it? Love. I love you, darling. I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love you enough to prune you. You don't have to turn there. I'm just reading this first before I do the altar call. One, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Therefore come out and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch that which is unclean, and I will receive you. You ready for this? And I will be a father to you. Wow. Father. 
It's so good. You shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. What a gift to be fathered by God. So the question is, can you be fathered? I want everybody to close their eyes right now. I'm going to do two altar calls. But I'm going to ask that the cameras are on me for this moment only. You'll see why in a second. I don't want anybody to feel embarrassed that the cameras see them in this moment. Just have the camera on me if that's okay. I want you to everybody close your eyes, please. I'm going to ask you some simple questions. If you know God has been trying to father you in certain areas and you've been resisting him, would you put your hand up high? Wow, that's a lot. That's almost everybody. No one can see you. Put your hand down. It's okay. No one's looking. The cameras are not on you. You can put your hand down. If you're living in sexual immorality, put your hand up high. Don't be ashamed. That's many. Sexual sin. Yep, there's many. Men and women. If you lie, put your hand up. Yep, many as well. God loves you so much. He's going to father you this morning. The last one I'll say. Is there anybody that the cycles and patterns of your life are hurting other people and God has been speaking to you and you haven't dealt with it yet? Put your hands up high. Yeah, that's a lot. Your loving father this morning wants to prune you. He wants to set you apart and he wants to set you free. And he wants to invite you to be fathered in a deeper way where you process these decisions with God. And where you surrender things to his feet and don't take them back and you really truly walk trusting him. It will start today, but it's a journey. It won't happen immediately. It's a journey. It will start in a deeper way though today. If you're here in this room this morning and you know, no, God, I have not been fathered by you correctly. There's been resistance in me. I don't know that kind of a depth of relationship, but I want it. I want you to run to the front as fast as you can, not slowly, quickly, very fast. Come up all the way on the steps here because I'm going to do a second order call. Come up all the way on the steps if you can because there's going to be more coming behind you. He's going to deliver you this morning, friends. Come up all the way on the steps, please, because we're going to do one last altar call. So come up high. So we need people, they're going to come behind you. Come up here. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to pray a simple prayer, but I want to invite you to be vulnerable today. Like I've been vulnerable with you. I invite you to be vulnerable with God. And for some of you, you may start crying out, screaming to God, like, God, I'm done with this. You may begin to weep like crazy. But there's a temptation sometimes when it's a little bit quiet like this, that, that we don't really be honest before God. We, we just be careful. And I'm going to pray today that you wouldn't be careful, that you would be broken open and that God would begin to father you. But let's all pray this one prayer together. Say, Father God, Father me, I invite your correction. I invite your rebuke. I invite you into the dysfunctional parts of my life. Reform my soul because you love me. And I know that you would only do that because you love me. And so Father, I pray today that every person here, that you would begin to touch them deeply with your love. Pour out your mercy. Pour out your mercy. Pour out your mercy. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. There's many people weeping. It's okay. You can let go. It doesn't matter if you're loud in this place. Pastor Michael and Jessica, one thing I know about them, they love so much the presence of God. They love the presence of God. And when God is moving, we don't stop Him. Father, we pray right now, prune them, father them. Leave whatever it was at the altar with your Father. Prune her, Lord, today. Let His mercy wash you. Let His mercy wash you, friend. Let 
Some of you, it's not a sin thing. It's just a resistance to certain areas of life. Go deep with your mercy. Go deep with your mercy. Go deep with your mercy. Isn't he a good father? Isn't he the best father? He knows how to find. Let it go deep in your heart. Let it go deep in your heart. He's going to father you back to life. Precious Father. Thank you, Lord. The Lord's beautiful mercy, I can feel it. This sweet hand of the Father, just pruning away what was stopping you from bringing free, from from growing in His house. Today, it's like a fresh beginning for you. Just encourage you one more time, just to really let go. You don't want this moment to be ruined by the fear of people's opinion. Let that love go deep in you. If you end up screaming out to God, that's okay. Sometimes the pruning hurts a bit and you're like, God, this I'm done with this now. I die to myself, I put my life into your hands. And I specifically feel the Lord is actually gonna remove not just the problem, but He's gonna remove the pain of the season, you know? Because when you've had a problem, it feels like you've been carrying burdens, big weights. Today, God will remove it. He'll remove all those burdens and all those weights from your heart, if you allow Him. And He loves you so deeply. Thank you, Father. Thank you, my King. You may be watching at home, And the same thing in your heart. You're like, God, I've been pushing you back. Don't resist Him. Say yes to Him this morning. Let Him prune you. Just go to your knees and say, Father, Father me, raise me up as a son. Raise me as a daughter. Raise me as a Jesus child, a Jesus-like man and woman of God. And I feel the Lord telling me to tell you, He hasn't been separated from you. He hasn't been separated from you. He's been trying to get to you. This is your morning where now you are coming to His feet. Thank you, Holy One. Thank you, Father. As they're praying, just keep praying. If, guys, I'm telling you, you can, if you really bowl your eyes out here for three hours, that's totally right. Just let it go really deep. I wanna pray one more thing. If there's anybody in this room and you've never met the Lord Jesus Christ or you did and you fell away and in hearing these words of Scripture, you're like, God, I, I'm not zealous. I, I feel my shame will be revealed one day. I'm naked, I don't feel clothed by you. I have sin in my life, I've walked away from you. Jesus, friend, He loves you enough to die for you. And He brought you here this morning. I believe you're on God's calendar. If you're in this room today and you know, my life isn't fully right with God, I backslid away or I haven't really surrendered, but I want to. 
The cross is simply this. It's, it's the work of God becoming flesh on our behalf, paying the penalty of our sins to reconcile us to God. It's not our human strength that brings us to God. It's God coming down like a man for our lives to reconcile us back to our Heavenly Father. It's not a work of our flesh. It's a returning to the cross. It's coming home to the cross. And this morning, as these precious saints are down here giving their Father their heart, what about your heart? What about your life? Is it right with God? Do you know what it feels like to be clothed in His righteousness, to be covered by His blood, to become His child? Sin, death, hell, Satan, the grave, it's destroyed by Jesus when you say yes. That's all He's asking for, a heart that is willing, that believes in His crucifixion, resurrection, and that He is the Son of God. If you believe this and you are willing to say yes to Him, He will give you a brand new life but you must say yes. If you are here in this room and that is you, I want you to raise up your hand as fast as you can. If you wanna return back to God, give your life to Him or the first time you're coming to God. No one is looking except me. I see you up the top in the balcony. Bless you, precious one. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, I see you, brother. Anybody else? Don't be afraid. Even if you're down the front here and you're like, I'm returning from my backsliding. You just put up your hand really quick if that's you. Yes, there's many down the front here, many on, on the wings there, on the side. Yes, down here, beautiful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Well, church, we're gonna pray a prayer. As these ones are receiving, I will not break, I'll, I'll only, if Pastor Michael and Pastor Jessica tell me to break that flow, I will immediately. I, I really love serving but I'm not going to have people stand and come down the front, um, but I'm gonna pray, church, can we just pray as these ones are down the front, just leave them in the presence of God. Let's pray together. So if you put your hand up for this, pray this with me. Lord Jesus Christ, let's all pray this together. Lord Jesus Christ, I confess that I'm a sinner, but I know You created me and I know I was made for more than this. I believe that You died on the cross for me and that You rose from the dead and that You are the very Son of God. Today, Jesus, I officially invite You into my heart as the Lord of my life. Come and wash me clean and make me a child of God. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn my back on sin, the devil and the ways of this world. And Father, I say now, I choose to put my trust in You, to follow You. Fill me with Your Holy Spirit. Fill me with Your Holy Spirit. Thank You, Lord. Thank You, Lord. Fill them, Lord. Fill them, Lord. The Lord is delivering you, friend. I don't know who you are, but today, God is making all things new. Today, in the Name of Jesus, I pray all things new. All things new, all things new. Today is a turning point. Today is a turning point. work. Ushers, I want you to be very sensitive. Carla, let's just have them get the elements out and ready. Do they have them? Okay, have them bring them up the aisles here. And they'll, everybody, if you come forward, you stay where you're at, if you'd like to. Praise you, Lord. I would like um, if, if a couple of you, uh, just one 
of the ushers with the bread, the other with the wine. If you would come up, I just need one of each on the platform. You in your seats, just lift your hands to the Lord. He's, he's moving beautifully. Judy, could you come up? Yeah, um, just be careful coming up. Thank you, Lord. If somebody could just help move this, that'd be wonderful. What a wonderful way to receive the body and blood of Jesus now. Freshly cleansed by the Lord. Many of you for the first time. Many of you are being set free right now. This is a beautiful moment now to receive the body and blood of Jesus. And I believe he'll continue to move. What I'd like to do is serve those who've come forward first. So those of you who are on this top step, uh, guys, let's just begin to serve them. Don't receive it until we pray. I'm going to begin praying now. And here's what I want you to do. Once we've, re once we've served those who've come forward, then our ushers uh, will serve you right around there in the aisles. They'll get down there. But I want you to come forward. This is the posture of your heart that you, that you need to have. Lord, I'm offering myself to you as I receive the offering that you are to me. It is offering for offering. My life for your life. And as Ben preached so beautifully, allow the Lord to father you and correct you and Approach the body and blood of Jesus with repentance in your heart. And I believe that as, as we receive, that many of you will be healed emotionally, physically. Your heart will burn with the presence of God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your body and blood. That is food for our hearts, food for our souls. Let the power of the Holy Spirit descend on this moment as we receive these elements. And let the healing power of Jesus begin to flow in the mighty name of Jesus. Once you've received, you're welcome to go. You're welcome to, to stay. I'm going to ask that those of you who are being served right now at the altar, that once you receive, if you're able, you feel like the Lord is done with you, to make your way back to your seat. Just be very, very careful doing so. You can receive when you're ready. Once you've received at the altar, I'm going to ask that you very carefully get up, make your way back to your seat. Ushers, I'll need some help, actually, just so we can make room for those who are going to receive. Then you can go back to your seat and sit in the presence of God. If you're on the stairs and you need to stay a little longer, you're more than welcome. But if you're at the altar on the floor, I'm going to ask, once you've received the body and blood of Jesus, that you just get up. Just go back to your seat very reverently and allow the Lord to touch you. Once they do that, ushers, Carla and the team, we can begin assembling the rows and uh, inviting them. May 
the Lord bless you once you've received as you go. May you go in the presence of the Lord. May his face shine upon you. May the oil of his spirit clothe you. And come back tonight hungry. In fact, as Ben was ministering, tonight will be a night, I've really heard this from the Lord. Tonight will be a night of prayer and impartation. We're going to lay hands on as many as we can tonight. The Lord will touch you deeply. The Lord will heal the sick tonight. I feel that strongly.
here we are standing in the exact location where the headquarters for Jesus image will be the local church Jesus school a house of Bethany all of that will be located right here in fact in the exact spot where Jesse and I are standing will be the beautiful pond in front of the sanctuary where we will most likely be holding baptism services occasionally so we're so excited we're right here in Seminole County off of Lake Mary Boulevard we own this land God owns this land, I should say. And the building will be right behind us. The sanctuary, the admin building, and the prayer house. And so listen, we just wanna say thank you so much. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for giving. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being so patient and believing with us. We're believing God that the nations will descend on this property, that they will worship Jesus, that the sick will be healed here, that the lost will be saved, that the presence and glory of God will rest here. We want that, we believe this is holy ground and that the tangible glory of Jesus will be right here on this land. And so we wanna invite you to come and invite you to be a part of what God is gonna do here. Yeah, we are just so very thankful for you. Thank you so much for your prayers and your love and support. We are truly blown away with what the Lord is doing and we cannot wait to have you here with us one day. Yeah, and we're really excited about what we're gonna show you right now. We wanna take you on a journey and show you the incredible design, detail, and vision of what will take place on this property. Our Jesus Image home will be located in the beautiful Seminole County, right off of Lake Mary Boulevard. This is a thriving area filled with families, restaurants, and the beautiful amenities that this area provides. The vision of this property is simple. We want the presence of Jesus Christ to be known. We have a deep value for experiencing the Lord in His beauty and the majesty of His creation. This facility will host our local church family, Jesus School, which is our discipleship training program, yearly conferences, the Bethany House of Prayer, and it will also be an outreach hub for the state and nation. There is vision behind everything. The location of the buildings, the landscaping, the water features, and of course the architectural design of the buildings themselves all speak to the beauty of the Lord. We want all who enter the property to feel as though they've entered into the peace of the presence of God. With all the stress and turmoil that people face on a daily basis, 
this will be a place of serenity, worship, reflection, and adoration. Rather than this feeling like a headquarters, we want this to be the house of God and a home for his people. You will notice that the structures themselves have a timeless look and design. From the stonework to the stained glass, it will feel like the house of God. The gospel will be declared from every side of the property in multiple different ways. As you pull into the new Jesus Image home, you will discover a massive parking area that will be framed by and filled with beautiful shrubbery and trees. There will be plenty of room for you and your family. A beautiful drive leads you to the sanctuary building. You will enter through a stone archway. Upon the archway, one of the foundational verses for Jesus Image will be inscribed. This verse carries the heartbeat of our lives and the construction of this house. Only one thing is needed, Luke 10, 42. Upon entering the front door to the main building, you will see a massive gathering area. It is a two-story structure. The first level will be filled with life. This will be a place to congregate with friends and family, to get your children checked into children's church, to eat, or simply enjoy a coffee around a beautiful fireplace. The first level will also house the youth room. We have a major focus on seeing this next generation love Jesus. The youth room will seat approximately 500 people. This room will also serve as the second year facility for Jesus School. Our children's rooms will be located on the first level. This will be a convenient experience for children and parents upon their arrival. Our children will receive amazing Bible teaching, a worship experience, and knowledge of the presence of the Holy Spirit for themselves. The second level of the main building will facilitate working spaces for our board of directors, our staff, and interns. This will be a great blessing for us as we move forward in wisdom as a ministry. As you know, God has graced Jesus' image with a massive reach through media. Thousands have come to Jesus, and so many have been healed and set free through our media ministry. We will have our very own production studio where we can create content and continue to stream live to the nations. We will release podcasts, social media content, videos, and much more. Multiplied millions have watched our media content, and we believe our creative team will flourish in this new space as they step out into this vital and anointed calling. As you walk across the main gathering space, you will discover the sanctuary. What an amazing space this will be. While we will have state-of-the-art technology in the sanctuary, the space will take you back in time, a time when churches had a sacred feel to them. You will discover beautiful stained glass behind the platform. Stained glass will line the sides of the sanctuary as well, all telling the gospel story of Jesus. There will be timeless wood beaming and stonework throughout. We long for his presence to fill this place, and it will be a home for you as well. We will seat approximately 1,500 people, yet it will not lose the personal feel that we so deeply value. The platform will be spacious with plenty of room for ministry, our worship teams, and of course, a baptismal. You will notice a round stained glass image on the back wall of the sanctuary depicting a dove in fire descending in the room. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts each time we gather as a church family. The sanctuary space will also serve Jesus School. This will house our hundreds of first year students as well as our general school sessions. These students will be missionaries to the nations of the world and to their generation. The gospel will be declared from this sanctuary space multiple times per week and people will be raised up from this place to share Jesus with the world. And may millions be saved, healed, and touched by the Holy Spirit. Lastly, for our favorite space in the property, the Bethany House of Prayer. This will be the prayer house for Jesus' image. It will be a place for adoration, silent prayer, reflecting upon the scriptures, and worship. You will notice that the house will be built upon a pond. The setting will be quaint and breathtaking. Stone and wood mark the space with warmth and a traditional look that we believe will transcend generations. We believe this will be the hub of the entire property. 
a place where intimacy with God and pure prayer ascend before him. It is named the Bethany House because Bethany was the place where Jesus was loved deeply. Therefore, he rested there. Mary found the better part, and it is our prayer that all who enter will find Jesus there and fall in love with him. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May he be adored and worshiped on this property. May his word be taught with clarity, boldness, and love. May his gospel flood the nations, and may the generations to come find him here. Will you stand with us? Will you pray and give toward this vision? Will you give sacrificially for the sake of Jesus and his gospel? Will you be a part of something that will outlive you for the sake of eternity? Thank you. We love you. Jesus is beautiful.